Welcome everyone to the Felix Instruments uh, F9XX Gas Analyzer Series webinar, Invisible Forces, Innovative Uses of Gas Analysis in Cold Storage, Ripening, and Food Innovation. So before we get started, we have some housekeeping stuff to cover uh, and some introductions to make. Uh, Susie Truitt uh, is our distributor manager here at Felix Instruments. She's been with the company for uh, eight years and she is going to be our webinar moderator. So she will be posting things in the chat <clears throat> and also uh, assisting people if they have technical difficulties of any kind. Um, let's go over some uh, housekeeping before we uh, get the, the actual presentation started. So uh, if you have any questions that uh, pertain to any of the content in the presentation um, or any questions that are uh, related at all to uh, uh, what we're talking about today, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, please do not use the chat box function for those questions. Um, the Q&A box is, if you look at the diagram, it's found on the right hand side of your uh, lower part of the screen. Um, that is where I, I will need you to input all of your questions you have so that when we get to the Q&A section of the presentation, I will then uh, be able to actually physically see all those questions and answer them uh, one by one and address each one individually. But uh, however, we will be utilizing the chat box um, for uh, posting any sort of relevant links. So do make sure that you uh, are checking the chat box uh, for any information that Susie uh, will be posting. Uh, that includes any hyperlinks that uh, you won't be able to click on because of the nature of Zoom. You won't be able to click on the presentation itself. So Susie will be able to post those links inside of the chat box. So, so please be sure to check that for any extra information, um, but refrain from using the chat box for anything other than uh, any kind of technical difficulties you may be experiencing, like a lack of sound or video. Um, for all questions pertaining to the presentation, uh, let me just reiterate, please use the Q&A box or the Q&A function in Zoom. So before we get started, a little about myself. Uh, my name is Galen George. I'm an application scientist at Felix Instruments. I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in food science from Michigan State. Um, I'm an IFT certified food scientist uh, and my previous experience is in managing uh, an analytical food testing laboratory um, and working as a food safety consultant um, in the produce, uh, food manufacturing and cannabis industries. We do have another application scientist on staff here, um, Eric Munoz Garcia. He uh, uh, kind of spearheads our support team. So uh, if you have any uh, issues with your instruments, um, if you already own a Felix instrument uh, and, and have issues, he's uh, the, your go-to contact. Um, he also has a lot of experience in the analytical world um, and is a great source of knowledge as well. So today uh, we're going to be talking about our gas analyzers. And so we're going to start off with the introductions and our company overview. Um, and then we're going to move into talking about ethylene and its role in fruit ripening and why gas analysis is important. Um, and to do this, we actually uh, are honored uh, enough to have um, uh, Greg from Catalytic Generators uh, uh, with us today. And he'll give a little presentation here shortly. Um, uh, in regard to how catalytic generators utilizes our instruments and also kind of give you guys a background on ethylene and why it's important and some real world use cases. Um, and then we're going to transition into talking about uh, uh, the F F9XX series of gas analyzers um, and then also uh, how those are used, uh, some, some applications, features, uh, details about the instruments. Um, as well as uh, talk about some research that's currently being done, some really cool research. Uh, and then we're going to end uh, with a Q&A session uh, with me um, and Greg will also still be uh, on, <clears throat> on as well to answer any questions uh, about uh, his part of the presentation. So, 
Uh, just to give you guys a little overview of our company, uh, Felix Instruments was founded six years ago, um, and uh, essentially we are a subsidiary of CID Bioscience, which uh, uh, has over 30 years of experience uh, in plant research instrumentation, developing tools uh, for uh, uh, plant physiology research, um, and we took that experience uh, to create uh, a kind of a set of tools that would be useful for the agricultural industry. Um, and so we kind of took an approach to create non-destructive measurement tools um, that would assist commercial agriculture to create a more consistent and a higher quality uh, product. So uh, we are really proud of the fact that all of our instruments are uh, designed, engineered, tested, and manufactured all under our roof here at our Camus Washington headquarters. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, now that you have an idea of what we are and what we do, let's get right into talking about our gas analysis uh, systems and why they're important. Um, so really there are uh, three critical gases for maintaining optimum produce quality. And those are oxygen, carbon dioxide, and then ethylene. Uh, and there are traditionally and currently three methods for measuring that, those gas concentrations. Um, and uh, they vary quite differently from each other. So there's gas chromatography or GC as it's commonly referred to. Um, then there's also optical or laser based uh, sensors and detectors and also electrochemical sensors or detectors. So the current uh, technology of gas chromatography has uh, really hasn't changed a whole awful lot in the fundamental aspect that uh, gas chromatography simply takes a mixture of, of components and uh, separates them using uh, a column with a fixed uh, media in it. And uh, by separating out uh, all the individual uh, compounds or analytes within that mixture, it can then uh, identify them and quantify them. So typically uh, what's uh, this technology is used for uh, headspace analysis and uh, measuring ethylene content. Um, and there are some advantages of using uh, uh, gas chromatography. Um, those mainly being that it takes a, it only takes a very small sample size uh, to uh, perform an analysis. Um, there is good selectivity. Um, it's really good at separating a mixture. So if, if you if you have a lot of volatiles in there, if you have a lot of other, if you're worried about a lot of contaminating volatiles, then it's a good technology for uh, filtering those out. Um, the analysis itself typically is pretty quick, fast. Uh, and once you have the system set up, it's fairly easy to operate. Um, and uh, there are uh, uh, some portable GCs available for the field, um, but uh, those are, are still not quite, um, and they're even, I would say, less effective than uh, uh, the current GC technology uh, as far as selectivity and sensitivity goes. Um, some disadvantages though uh, are the fact that it does have limited sensitivity. Um, so uh, getting down to the really small uh, parts per billion, parts per you know, trillion even ranges are, are nearly uh, impossible. Um, it does require some prep as well to, uh, to make sure uh, before you inject it onto the instrument that you have to concentrate it down um, so you can get better sensitivity. Uh, and then also there is a lot of costs involved. Uh, as if anyone has had experience with gas chromatography, you know, it, uh, it, it is not a cheap instrument and it's not a uh, cheap instrument to maintain. Uh, it, uh, there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. A lot of labor and time goes into setting up the instrument itself uh, and then also keeping it maintained. Um, uh, it can be, uh, especially with older instrumentation, it can be quite a hassle. So that's just uh, one of the current uh, ways that people are analyzing uh, gases such as ethylene or oxygen or CO2. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is the optical or laser based uh, uh, detectors. Uh, these images here, the top one on the, is on the left there is a, uh, a photoacoustic um, setup. And then the bottom one is more of a, a inline uh, type of uh, setup for uh, utilizing essentially uh, the, the same way that a, uh, 
in a similar way, I wouldn't say the same way that a spectrometer works. Uh, uh, ethylene has its own uh, pattern of absorption or uh, specific absorption characteristics that uh, allow you to uh, shine light uh, in it, at it at, in some way and, and observe the absorption in certain uh, wavelength regions. Uh, so by being able to identify which uh, uh, regions are the most uh, selective for ethylene, you can then uh, identify and quantitate uh, ethylene based on its absorption at, at those certain wavelengths. And the benefit of this technology is that it has extreme sensitivity. You can get down to you know, parts, low parts per billion ranges um, very accurately. Uh, the, uh, the technology is also very, uh, a rapid detection system. Um, it does have good selectivity. Uh, you can use it as this image shows in the bottom uh, for like a real time monitoring or inline system. Um, and typically they are, uh, uh, the, they do have options for uh, compact or, or use, you know, transportable uh, uh, instrumentations. The problem with uh, optical uh, uh, based detectors is that they are wildly expensive um, and they're uh, typically out of most people's price ranges. And also uh, they're uh, really only uh, available for a single detecting a single gas. So essentially, uh, if you wanted to be able to uh, measure uh, multiple gases in, in one space, you would need multiple different detectors that are specific for uh, those gases. So instead of one instrument that can that can do all three, you would have three instruments. Uh, and that can that can get quite pricey. So the third technology, and uh, technology that we utilize at Felix Instruments uh, is electrochemical sensors. Uh, they rely on uh, essentially a, a, a gas, a concentration of gas um, being uh, transformed into some sort of uh, physical signal uh, like a change in electrical current or resistance. Um, and so uh, with these sensors, uh, there are a lot of advantages uh, that we, that, that, and that, that's the reason really why we chose them um, is because they, they are uh, fairly uh, sensitive and specific. You can get down uh, to the PPB range if you really, uh, uh, if you have good sensors, um, you can get really good repeatability and accuracy. They are uh, very fast uh, systems. Uh, you can get measurements in less than a minute and then uh, the sensors can recover uh, uh, in a matter of, of a, a minute or two as well. Um, they really don't require a lot of power, which means that you can make these systems very portable and easy to use either in the field or in a laboratory. Um, the batteries can last uh, for a very long time, eight, up to eight hours of continuous measurement. Um, typically they're very, you know, uh, lightweight. We can make our instruments pretty lightweight and user friendly um, and all at a pretty low cost, which is the really the biggest benefit. Um, some disadvantages uh, are that uh, uh, they can be sensitive to interfering gases. So uh, much like uh, how the opposite of how a GC is, is good at, is good at uh, separating out mixtures, electrochemical sensors aren't as great at that. Um, but there are solutions to that, which we will discuss later in the presentation. Um, uh, they are uh, usually limited to a certain temperature range. Uh, um, uh, they do require oxygen to operate correctly, so you can't uh, put it in a complete uh, you know, vacuum or anything like that. Um, and uh, the sensors do have a limited shelf life and they are sensitive to, uh, their lifetime is sensitive to how much uh, of the uh, analyte of interest or the gas of interest is, uh, is constantly being, uh, you know, um, exposed to those sensors. So, uh, but with that, um, uh, there is the uh, idea that it is a lot easier to just uh, swap out sensors and it's still fairly cheap and it's a pretty easy process. Um, so even though they have a limited shelf life and the limited lifetime, um, it's really not uh, that big of a deal. And it's not like you would have to be changing them out, uh, you know, on a weekly basis or anything like that. So these are the three technologies 
that uh, uh, currently exist, and, and, and I wanted to talk about these before we get into talking about ethylene specifically, um, because I want you to have an image in your mind of, of, of uh, the solutions that uh, we can provide based on our electrochemical sensors and our instrumentation. As Greg goes to uh, begin his discussion uh, and talk about ethylene, the role of ethylene in ripening and, and, and other operations, and then talk about some case studies of how, uh, you know, monitoring, monitoring the ethylene levels uh, is, is, is of, you know, essential importance. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce to you guys uh, Greg Akins from Catalytic Generators. He is the president and CEO of Catalytic Generators, and he's been involved in the fresh fruit industry uh, since 1985 and has a lot of experience in uh, post-harvest, uh, especially when it comes to uh, produce like bananas, tomatoes, uh, and tropical fruits. Um, and he has a lot of experience in the ripening process for these fruits. So um, without further ado, Greg, I will mute myself and stop my video and uh, I'll let you take over. Hi, everyone, and thanks for uh attending this, uh, this webinar. I'm honored to be here and talk a little bit about ethylene and uh, the good and the bad, mostly, mostly the good since it's such a helpful uh, uh, plant hormone. Uh, so without further delay, what is ethylene? It's a simple hydrocarbon. Um, you find it uh, readily available in the, uh, in the atmosphere. It comes from combustion engines. It comes from uh, uh, decaying produce. It comes from plants. Uh, it comes from fruit. And the last one is, is a good thing because it helps us to, uh, to apply ethylene to, to, to fruit to, to ripen it. Um, external ethylene, when applied to fruit, oh, there's our slide, um, fruits, fruits respond to it um, and start, start producing their own internal ethylene, which is a, which is a great thing because it allows us to, um, to grow produce, to grow fruit globally and then ship it a long distance and then ripen it, of course, regionally, which enables us to uh, have superior ripened fruit ready to eat on a local basis. Otherwise, it'd be very difficult to have fruit um, grown and shipped all over the world and our, our availability of fruit would be limited. So there's also the negative side of ethylene, which is the, the fact that it helps, um, it, it speeds deterioration of, of um, of leafy greens, for instance, flowers, just a few ppm of, of ethylene, and in some cases a few ppb or parts per billion of ethylene will will uh, cause ripe uh, will cause decay on on fruit and flowers and and such. A, a big topic about ethylene is how do you remove it from um, from the atmosphere or from a cold storage room. Um, one of the biggest keys first is to test and make sure that is the problem. And that's where Felix's meters come in very handy for measuring um, in a cold storeroom to see if ethylene is actually the problem. So once that's discovered that there is one or two PP, PPM, parts per million of ethylene, uh, there's various ways to, to go about removing it. Um, first, remove the source. Perhaps there's something nearby like combustion engines or forklifts that's creating, um, creating ethylene. So get rid of those. Maybe there's fruit close by that's uh, infiltrating the storage room. <clears throat> so you need, to, you need to remove those. Second would be to ventilate, to ventilate the space. And lastly would be to, to scrub the room with potassium permanganate or some other um, mechanism that, that oxidizes and removes the ethylene. There's a lot of products out there that, that do that. So anyway, that's enough about the bad. Let's focus a little bit more on the good. There's many fruits that are ripened with ethylene. Predominantly, you see on the screen here, bananas. That's been done for over 50 years, ripening bananas with, um, with ethylene, triggering the, the, the ripening of their own internal ethylene. Avocados um, are ripened regionally now, and that's huge for us to have ready to eat avocados at retail. Um, also, field-grown tomatoes are, are, are harvested mature green, as all these fruits are harvested mature green and then ethylene applied to them to trigger the, uh, to trigger the ripening. Um, let me speak just for a second on the, the ripening recipe that happens. Um, you have to have ethylene, of course, but that's just the trigger. 
you also go go back one slide please you also have to have um the right temperature you have to have the right humidity and you have to control the carbon dioxide and oxygen as the fruit respires it it, it takes in oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide and you have to remove that so that's a a recipe ethylene is just one part of it of course it's not going to happen without ethylene but it won't happen without the other proper ingredients as well uh, so there's other fruits as you see on this slide that that benefit from an ethylene application um, just to highlight a few of them um, uh, mostly uh, it's again it's mostly bananas and, and, and avocados but also pears is a, is a big one there's a interesting highlight about pears they used to not be ripened on a regionally basis on a regional basis they were mostly just shipped to the to the stores and it was very difficult to find a pear that was ready to eat you would sit it on your counter at home for for, for perhaps a week before it was ready to eat well with the advent of using ethylene they were able to ripen in a similar way that they ripen bananas and do it on a regional basis um, which then allowed the supermarkets to have pears that are essentially ready to eat that day and pear sales um, skyrocketed because of that a uh, similar uh, thing is starting to happen with mangoes there's a big push now to, to try to ripen uh, mangoes on a regional basis at produce distribution centers or wholesale distribution uh, centers so that we can offer ready to eat mangoes at retail uh, because once you go in and buy a pear or a mango that's that's not ready to eat and you expect it to be ready to eat odds are you're, you won't go back and purchase another one so offering ready to eat um, fruit is is, is a, a huge um, advantage for supermarkets and of course people that grow mangoes and pears so a new application um, as well as greenhouse tomatoes um, by exposing um, greenhouse tomatoes uh you'll 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 get them to, to ripen faster of course the key is um greenhouses need to remove these tomatoes quickly um so that they can replant this is the end of the life of the plant they need to pull it out and um and replant so by exposing that entire greenhouse which as you can imagine is a huge space they expose just a few ppm um to the tomatoes and it speeds up the uh, production increases the uh, uniformity of the, of the harvest. And it's a huge improvement upon the former practice, which was a spray ethophon, which would leave a, um, a residue on the tomatoes. Ethylene leaves no residue because as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a natural plant hormone just interacting with the plant and causing it to generate its own ethylene and ripen naturally. Ethylene is also allowed for um, organic use which is a big benefit. We wouldn't have organic bananas if, if ethylene wasn't allowed. So it is a natural plant hormone. It's been recognized as, as such. So therefore the organic standards um, allow for the use of ethylene on tropical fruit. And you see tropical fruit in, in um, parentheses. That's because tropical fruit, you have to define it. Uh, that's left up to the uh, organic certifier. So if you are, a, a, if you want to ripen a particular fruit that's organic you have to have your certifier say that the fruit you're ripening is is indeed tropical so fortunately that covers most fruits that we ripen like bananas and avocados and mangoes so how do you get ethylene there's several sources uh, first we'll talk about gas cylinders um, there are several types there's 100 percent pure which is um, a cylinder with just completely ethylene in it uh, works fine for ripening produce, uh, for ripening fruit. The problem with ethylene is it is explosive. So if a cylinder was to fail or whatever your source is, is to fail and allow too much ethylene into the room, you could reach the lower explosion limit of ethylene, which is 27,000 ppm. And on our website, catalyticgenerators.com, we have some case studies of, uh, of where ethylene has blown up a ripening room and caused um, uh, damage and even death in some cases. So what was created to sort of mitigate that uh, risk is a 4% mix of ethylene with either nitrogen or carbon dioxide. So when you're releasing 
those contents into a ripening room, it's next to impossible to get to the explosive level. However, you do have to use quite a bit of the contents of that cylinder to get to the ripening range, which we'll talk about in a minute as far as how many PPMs are required. So that's a not a very efficient product. It does work, but it's also very expensive because again, you're having to release a mixed um, compound into a ripening room and get to a certain level. So back in 1973, our company faced with these um, challenges developed ethylene generators. So our system, uh, next slide please. Our system consists of, you see here a, a, a bottle of liquid called ethogen and you pour it into the, to the generator and it creates ethylene on a, a timed basis. It's easy to use. Um, you just, again, pour the bottle in and it, the ethylene is made on site versus storing large quantities of pre-made ethylene. And the other advantage of our product is that it's, there's no explosion possibility. Um, to reach an explosion level in a room like you see here, which holds about 20 pallets, you would need about 10 generators to get to the explosive level. So that the fact that we're easy to use and have a safe product, um, we have been able to sell our products all over the world now. And in many parts of the world, we're up as the, the, the standard for ethylene application. To, <clears throat> so if you go to the, the, the next slide, there's a case study um, where we were able to help a chain store in California that, uh, that was using a 4% mix of ethylene. And <laughs> we received a call from them that uh, they weren't able to run the bananas. And the, the, the problem ended up being that there was no ethylene in their, in their cylinder the company that provided them with the mix of, of gases did not include any ethylene. So they wanted to try using our generator and uh, they used it on a few rooms and the results were so good that they switched all of their rooms to ours and they found out that it was less expensive and it was much better ripening because of the uniformity um, of the ethylene that we created from the machine. So just a case study there where we helped someone um, switch to, to an easier to use in safer system and ended up with, with better color on their fruit. Another case study is, is in Australia. Um, we just started selling there about six years ago and they were predominantly using the, the ethylene mix with, with carbon dioxide. And of course, one of the reasons you ventilate a room is to get rid of carbon dioxide. Well, the mix there uses carbon dioxide as the inert, which doesn't tend to make a whole lot of sense since you need to ventilate the room to remove the carbon dioxide that the fruit is generating. Well, you're also pumping in more as an inert so that your ethylene won't blow the room up. So we ended up with a, a test at a large chain store in, in Australia. And we put this, you see a picture here of our centralized system, which pumps the liquid to every room uh, versus having to, uh, to fill the generator. Um, they love the results of this so much, they've switched all their rooms over to our system just because of the, again, similar to the California situation, um, it's, it's much easier to use, better ripening because there's no inert gas pumped in um, and the color is more uniform and, and brighter. So not only did they switch over all these rooms, they're building a new distribution center and putting in uh, our ethylene generators. If you go to the next slide, you'll see, um, a little bit of talk about the, the, the ripening process. Um, there's many fruits, like we talked about earlier, that can be triggered to ripen using, using ethylene. I'll speak mostly here on bananas, and uh, you see the recipe there again. Um, ethylene is the trigger, and time and temperature is the sort of control. Ethylene just triggers the ripening. Temperature will speed up or slow down the ripening, but you also have to have the right humidity and the right ventilation. Um, there's a color chart there you see for bananas and the influence of the, the temperature over the whole process. Once you trigger it for that one day, you control it with the temperature. So I won't delve in too deep on any of the ripening procedures for these fruits, but uh, if you visit our website, you'll see all of these and we're always available to help with, uh, with ripening uh, on any of these fruits. So all you have to do is contact us and we'll be glad to help. Um, to speak a little bit on ethylene measurement, we do recommend that our customers measure ethylene. You can control it well with our generator, but it's always good to know the starting point. 
of what the ethylene level is. And you can easily achieve that with one of Felix's meters. Um, and then you adjust the ethylene level of the machine to match the parts per million that you want. As far as parts per million, most ripeners for bananas are after anywhere from 100 to 500, in some cases 1,000. It sort of just depends on what location of the world you're in and uh, the maturity of your fruit. Some, some prefer to use more, some less. Um, so measurement of it is, is critical to, to know exactly where you are. Fortunately, with most fruits, you can't over-apply ethylene, but the over-application is, is waste. So we try to promote efficiency and recommend that you measure in order to be at the, at the proper level. Um, it is key to measure ethylene for citrus. Uh, citrus only requires about five parts per million to ripen, and over-application will, will damage the fruit. So in that aspect, a Felix low-range meter is, is critical to the process not only to do spot measurements uh, weekly, I would recommend spot measurements daily, or even a, one of the Felix products that uh, continuously monitors the ethylene level and can adjust the output of the generator to match your parts per million. So with that, I think I've said enough. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end and I'll turn it over to Galen now. Awesome, thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate it. So let's move on to talking more about um, the ripening gases and then we'll move on to uh, our specific instrumentation and uh, how uh, we can help you achieve uh, uh, your uh, monitoring goals or your, me your measurement uh, needs uh, and then um, at the end as Greg said uh, him and I will both be available to answer questions any questions you may have about um, uh, the Felix Instruments uh, monitoring side or the ethylene generation side of catalytic generators. Um, so let's uh, dive back into uh, the ripening gases. Greg did a great explanation of, of ethylene and why it's important. Um, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, are also, as he mentioned, uh, uh, pretty important uh, gases uh, in the ripening process. Uh, specifically, carbon dioxide, uh, uh, you know, is, is a determiner of metabolic activity um, uh, of the fruit, uh, and so by artificially elevating CO2, um, you can actually slow respiration rates of the fruit and make it last longer. Um, uh, for, as far as oxygen is concerned, um, decreasing oxygen also can extend a, the lifetime of a, of, of produce, um, decreasing oxidation. Um, an oxidative stress, um, but uh, if you if you eliminate oxygen, then you uh, run the risk of anaerobic respiration, which can damage the fr uh, the fruit and cause spoilage. So, um, it's really important to maintain very specific levels of 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 all three of these gases to ensure that your uh, fruit is of optimum quality uh, 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 throughout uh, your storage process. Um, or if you're a uh, if you are a retail outlet, then you want to make sure it's ready to eat. Um, but also that requires you to maintain your fruit at specific conditions. So, um, with our electrochemical sensing uh, uh, devices, uh, that's uh, the easiest way for you to uh, monitor these gases and 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 make sure that the levels are where you need them to be. So we have uh, uh, a whole line of uh, what we call the F9XX gas analyzers. And we only say XX because um, they go from anywhere from 900 all the way up to 960. So the XX is really just the last two digits of the uh, model number. So um, here I uh, have images of uh, our nine F900 uh, portable ethylene analyzer our F920, which is our, we call our check it gas analyzer. The F940 is our store it gas analyzer. The F950 is our three gas analyzer. And the F960 is our ripen it gas analyzer. Now you might notice that the bottom four uh, instruments all look extremely similar. They just vary in color. Um, and that's for a good reason. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, I will, something I will uh, discuss in a second here, um, but all of these instruments uh, are capable of measuring uh, uh, both uh, oxygen and CO2. Um, uh, the F920 is specifically uh, not for, it uh, does not include ethylene. 
uh, an ethylene sensor. It's really just for looking at uh, oxygen and CO2 levels and things like modified atmosphere packaging. Um, but all of these instruments uh, uh, are uh, uh, vital tools that can be used in a, in a variety of applications. And one key key thing with all of our analyzers that uh, have ethylene sensors um, is that we had to develop a system to ensure that uh, uh, when we're measuring ethylene uh, via the electrochemical sensor uh, that we aren't over measuring uh, due to the presence of volatiles. Uh, and this is a very uh, common uh, occurrence that can occur with electrochemical sensors, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. They aren't uh, a very selective, uh, as, as, as the GC is, uh, the, the, electro uh, the electrochemical sensors really aren't that selective. So to mitigate this, uh, uh, Greg already mentioned some strategies such as uh, uh, removing yourself from environments where there is a lot of uh, combustion engines, that could produce uh, ethylene or other volatiles in the environment, uh, removing yourself away from uh, the presence of other fruit or, or, or ethylene producing um, uh, 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 biological materials, um, and uh, uh, really uh, staying away from other things like uh, industrial solvents or paints, uh, uh, things that can produce uh, plastics that can produce uh, a lot of volatiles. Um, that's really the, the, the first step in, in, in making sure that you are measuring uh, just ethylene uh, and you're not over, uh, it's not being over measured due to the presence of these volatiles. Now, the other thing that we came up with uh, to uh, uh, help ensure this as well uh, is our uh, patented water filter system, uh, which we call PolarCept. So it really uh, is a pretty simple uh, setup. It, just uses uh, two PTFE filters. Um, the intake of the gas would go pass through a PTFE filter, and then it is bubbled through deionized water. Uh, and the deionized water acts as a trap to uh, trap any sort of polar uh, volatiles that might be uh, uh, present within your intake gas. Uh, so things like ethanol and isoamyl acetate would be stuck uh, and, and, and would uh, uh, dissolve into the water, while the ethylene, being nonpolar, uh, would travel through the water and uh, travels through another PTFE filter and then into the instrument to actually be detected. So this system has been very effective. We actually uh, had uh, a, when we were developing this system, a, a local professor at Portland State University um, uh, conducted an entire study to make sure that this is a, this system was actually effective, uh, doing measurements uh, on a GC to make sure that <clears throat> we were filtering out uh, a good amount of the volatiles. And it turns out this does a great job of filtering out uh, uh, over 95% of, of the volatiles that uh, are gonna be present in the airstream. Um, so as long as you take the, both the precaution of, of being away from combustion engines and pollutants, um, as well as using this polar sub device, uh, you can be uh, uh, pretty certain that uh, the sensor is only going to be measuring ethylene by the time the air reaches the sensor. Our F900 portable ethylene analyzer uh, is our um, most sensitive uh, ethylene analyzer that we offer. Um, this is the uh, a system that uh, contains two different ethylene sensors and one uh, uh, brings it uh, the range all the way down to 25 ppb while um, the uh, other uh, uh, sensor is a uh, higher range uh, ppm sensor uh, will, that will get you up to 200 ppm. So it's a, uh, a very sensitive instrument um, and it's a, a very useful uh, research tool um, as it has uh, multiple measurement modes. Um, it has a continuous monitoring ability. Uh, so you could uh, um, utilize that in something like a storage facility or a greenhouse. Um, it does also have a, a, a trigger mode ability where it takes an, uh, in, uh, a measurement from uh, a single uh, uh, point in time. Um, and that, that is a useful uh, tool for anything like um, uh, uh, 
uh, inspecting uh, containers, shipping containers, um, doing spot checking for quality assurance. Um, and then uh, another uh, uh, useful uh, measurement mode of the F900 is the, is the GC emulation mode, which a lot of people um, like to use uh, uh, for uh, uh, doing measurements of uh, samples they've collected out in the field. Um, or uh, using it uh, in replacement of, of their GC system, which is, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, old or they haven't, you know, maintained it over the years. And so they don't want to put the effort into uh, trying to get it back up and working. So it kind of is, uh, as a, as acts as a small, more portable uh, GC um, in the sense that uh, it uses a small amount of volume and you can directly inject your uh, your sample into the instrument. Um, uh, it does not have an internal column, so it's not separating anything uh, like that, but um, it is uh, what we call just a GC emulator, uh, uh, which means that it, you, do, you can use a very small volume of sample. You can directly inject it on and get results um, pretty much almost you know, instantaneously. Um, we also, in this uh, slide, uh, have an image, two images here of our research kit. So this is a, a useful tool for uh, researchers that want to investigate uh, the effect of, of uh, treatments or, or, or difference in varieties of, 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 of produce out in the field um, that they collect. And then uh, you can use this uh, self-contained jar to uh, or this uh, um, uh, vessel to hold your fruit in there and and measure the natural production of ethylene um, as well as co2 and, and oxygen um, and it's a really nice tool for that so moving into our series of handheld uh, gas analyzers here uh, the F920, as I mentioned earlier, is the only one of our series that does not uh, measure ethylene. It's only for uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Uh, it has a zero to 100% range uh, for both of those sensors. Um, you can get results in less than 10 seconds uh, because there's no ethylene involved. Um, and it's a good tool for modified atmosphere packaging, inspection, um, or uh, any kind of scenario where ethylene really isn't a concern for you. And it's, it's a really simple and fast uh, tool to use um, just for carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, and then getting into our series uh, that does include ethylene, uh, uh, this is our F940, which is our lower range uh, ethylene uh, uh, gas analyzer. So in addition to the carbon dioxide and, and oxygen sensors, the uh, ethylene sensor within there has a, uh, a range of zero to 10 ppm. So it gets down to the uh, PPB range um, that you would need for really sensitive applications like citrus degreening. Um, and it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's an ideal uh, tool for anything that uh, uh, is an ethylene sensitive commodity. Um, so anything that requires low measurements of ethylene or uh, uh, gives off low, uh, low amounts of ethylene. If you want to detect those, the F940 is the, is the, the correct tool for that. And then our most, uh, I would say our, one of our most popular uh, handheld gas analyzers, it's kind of our workhorse general use um, uh, uh, gas analyzer is our F950. So the F950 has a range of zero to 200 ppm ethylene uh, with a lower detection limit around uh, 500 ppb or 0.5 ppm. Uh, this instrument is great, uh, has been used a lot, uh, as I will talk about later, has been used a lot in a wide variety of applications um, from looking at uh, ethylene and in, in, in research uh, applications, uh, as well as in the industry uh, uh, doing spot checking and quality assurance uh, in, in, in facilities and in, in storage facilities and ripening rooms. And um, it's a really uh, general use, uh, general purpose uh, instrument that a lot of people, uh, uh, regardless of their application, can find a good use for. And then our last uh, uh, gas analyzer is the F960, um, which uh, 
has an ethylene range of zero to uh, 500 ppm um, with a lower detection limit of 10 ppm. So uh, this instrument is good for those forest ripening applications where um, as Greg was mentioning, like with bananas, uh, some operations, you know, need to use um, uh, quite, a, quite a high concentration of ethylene to get those bananas to ripen. Depends on the region, uh, uh, obviously, but uh, this is the instrument that would be good for monitoring uh, those higher levels of ethylene um, and, and ensuring that uh, your sensor doesn't wear out as quickly because this sensor was designed to handle higher concentrations of ethylene if you attempted to use a, a F940, for instance, in a forest ripening application, your sensor would uh, need to be replaced pretty rapidly because it's going to be overwhelmed by the amount of ethylene that is, uh, that is, it is being bombarded with. So um, that's, a, that's an overview of, of, of each of our gas analyzers that we offer. Uh, as far as our handheld gas analyzers are concerned, um, each handheld uh, analyzer has two different types of measurement modes that I want to talk about. Um, so the, uh, the first is the continuous mode. So this is a continuously monitoring um, a mode where you get a live updating graph of, of the ga different gas concentrations um, and the data uh, for those concentration is saved every second. So you get a uh, 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 a data point every one second of the of the concentration of carbon dioxide, oxygen, and ethylene. Um, these are uh, this is a great uh, measurement mode for uh, uh, in, uh, monitoring an environment that is that is constantly changing. If you're making changes to a to an environment, to a storage room or a ripening room, and you want to make sure um, that you are uh, getting uh, the correct levels of CO2, O2, and, and ethylene. Um, it's great for that. Uh, it's also great for, uh, say, uh, you uh, are looking for an area, uh, you know, there's a certain uh, area of your ripening room that's been uh, giving you issues. Uh, these bananas are ripening way too fast uh, in this one little area. Um, you can use this uh, uh, tool as a constant or in the continuous mode to look for uh, those hot spots of, of ethylene or those uh, you know, those pockets of, of oxygen or CO2 that are present within the room and uh, that will allow you to kind of uh, uh, mitigate that uh, risk of, of overexposure to ethylene or, or oxygen or, or carbon dioxide to make sure that uh, your fruit is very consistent. The other mode is the trigger mode. Um, this mode uh, is depicted in this picture here uh, using a, uh, a needle to uh, sample the atmosphere within this spinach bag of, of spinach. Um, essentially how the trigger mode works is it's a, uh, a continuous flow through of, of air. So it's intaking air until it reaches a stable reading, a consistent reading. Um, so uh, depending on how homogenous the um, atmosphere of that wherever you're sampling is, uh, then uh, you could get, uh, uh, you could only require a very small sample size. Um, so kind of similar to like a GC, the GC emulation mode of the F900. Um, these, uh, this will also just give you a single final value. So it's kind of like a spot measurement, um, which is, makes it ideal for doing spot checking inspections. Um, it's great for uh, checking uh, gas levels of a static location. Uh, like, like in this image, looking at uh, uh, the levels of ethylene and carbon dioxide and oxygen and modified atmosphere packaging um, or headspace accumulation and storage jars. Um, those are all uh, uh, potential applications to use the trigger mode, uh, 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 measurement mode. So now I'm just going to talk to you about some uh, features really quick of our instruments. This kind of goes for a lot of our instruments on the Felix Instruments uh, side of, of things. Um, all of these handheld devices are uh, GPS enabled. So you can, if you're out in the field, you can track where your measurements were taken. Um, they are Wi-Fi uh, capable. So you can uh, download your data either wirelessly um, or you can upload your data directly from the SD card where you're, uh, all the data is internally logged. 
Um, the instruments are fast and easy. Uh, they're lightweight, portable, durable. Um, they all come with an internal potassium permanganate uh, chamber that will scrub out the ethylene in between measurements so you can be sure that um, you're not getting uh, any sort of influence from previous measurements uh, when you are taking an ethylene reading. Um, they are also able to be used in the field. So they have a transflective display, which is good for outdoor viewing, kind of like a Amazon Kindle. Um, and they uh, use uh, uh, rechargeable or replaceable batteries uh, that can last up to eight hours, depending on your application. Some uh, really quick additional information that you might want. Uh, uh, we do have uh, a blog post on our website uh, called How to Choose the Best Gas Analyzer for You. Uh, so essentially, like I mentioned, each of our uh, series, the 940, 950, and 960, uh, which do all three gases, they do uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and ethylene, um, they all measure uh, a different range of ethylene, which this image uh, depicts. So you really uh, uh, you know, need to know going into uh, this uh, decision to purchase an instrument, uh, what uh, an idea of what range of ethylene you're gonna need to be monitoring. So if it's something like a forest ripening application, you're gonna want a 960 because it can go up to 500 ppm uh, ethylene. And then you're gonna wanna also look at, uh, or you know, maybe you don't know uh, in the case of you aren't sure yet because no one's ever done it before, which happens to be the case for a lot of researchers, um, uh, you know, it's it's probably best to start off with the 950 because it's the one that has the middle of the road range. It can get down to 500 ppb, but it also can get up to 200 ppm. So um, it's really a, a decision uh, that has a lot of factors to think about going into it that uh, uh, you can check out that blog post and see uh, uh, what other tips we have before uh, you go into a uh, uh, decision of which instrument uh, is best for you. And then below here we have a, I have a, um, an example of our sensor calibration schedule for our F950, just so you have an idea of how often you need to uh, perform a, a calibration. Uh, uh, and so as you can see, you only really need to perform a a true calibration uh, uh, twice a year. Uh, so a span calibration is simply just uh, zeroing the instrument as well as having some sort of standard gas uh, at a uh, high, uh, higher concentration, um, somewhere around the you know, middle to higher end of your, your uh, sensor's range. Um, so that only needs to happen twice a year. Uh, and then uh, the zeroing uh, of the instrument, uh, which is a very easy process for most of, uh, for all these gases, um, needs to either be done uh, weekly for ethylene or just uh, uh, twice a year uh, for the CO2 or the oxygen. So it's really not an instrument that has to be maintained very often. Um, it's designed to be robust and work uh, well over the course of time. So. That's just another thing for your consideration. As we've already talked about uh, uh, a lot, and Greg already mentioned a lot of these, and I've already kind of sprinkled them in throughout this presentation, there's a really wide variety of applications that these instruments can be used for, and they aren't really just limited to ripening. So uh, yes, they can be used in the post-harvest system for you know, looking at quality management of your cold storage room or your ripening room. Um, but they also uh, are good for looking at uh, packaging efficacy. So making sure that the uh, modified atmosphere that's within your packaging is actually uh, doing uh, the job that it needs to do um, and, and, and uh, monitoring uh, the changes within that packaging over time uh, to improve the shelf life of your product uh, and the freshness of your product. Um, uh, and quality assurance roles, you can use it for um, uh, as if you're a retail outlet, you can use it for inspection, you can use it for spot checking. Um, uh, you can, as a distributor or a, a packer, you can uh, look at the quality of your fruit um, uh, and, and the, you know, the levels of, uh, of ripeness that, it's, that, it, that you're uh, uh, you know, desiring. 
you can monitor your gas levels of, uh, with our instruments there. Um, import assessment, so fruit that's coming in from, uh, from overseas, uh, you can use that to ensure that, uh, you know, over the transportation process that uh, the, the ethylene levels, you know, uh, have either risen or, or, or they stayed the same or, um, uh, so it's a good, it's a really robust tool. Um, and I think one of the uh, biggest application, growing sectors of, of, of applications for this instrument is really the research and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of uh, 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 at the university and government level, um, a lot of people are utilizing this instrument uh, and not just for uh, looking at uh, uh, ethylene and forest ripening applications. There's a lot of other really cool um, uh, research out there that's that's been going on, and and a lot of and a lot of people are are utilizing our instruments in their research to monitor these levels of these gases. Um, some some examples here, uh, and Susie uh, uh, will post these links in the chat for you. The links to the uh, abstracts for these articles, but these are some uh, recent studies that have been conducted um, utilizing our uh, uh, F9XX gas analyzers. Um, so in 2017, um, we had uh, uh, some people uh, investigating uh, a new way to uh, uh, coat avocados to keep them fresh. Um, uh, and uh, it was a really interesting uh, study uh, looking at uh, basically plant material uh, uh, and as a, uh, a organic and edible coating on the outside of the avocado. Um, that actually is more efficient than anything like a wax uh, or anything of uh, artificial of that nature. So that was a really cool uh, a way for them to utilize our instruments to monitor how effective the coating was at, 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 at uh, uh, preserving the shelf life um, uh, and prolonging the shelf life of the avocados. Uh, another study uh, was done using our gas analyzers uh, very, very recently um, to look at uh, uh, post-harvest uh, wounding stress uh, uh, and extrusion um, as a tool to increase the concentration of free and bound phenolics in carrots. Uh, so they uh, were uh, essentially wounding uh, uh, or causing stress uh, 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 to induce uh, the release of, uh, of phenolics or the creation of phenolics in carrots um, and using our instruments to monitor uh, uh, things like ethylene, uh, which is a, uh, a hormone uh, released when plants are under stress as well. So that's a very interesting application. Uh, we had another person use our uh, uh, F950, I believe, to look at um, how ultrasound treatment uh, can actually result in uh, the accumulation of bioactive compounds in broccoli florets. So there's a really, uh, you know, and it's not these, the use of these instruments isn't limited to just post harvest applications. There's food chemistry and people using, uh, you know, ultrasonic sonochemistry uh, and then horticulture, horticulture uh, horticulturists. Uh, so really it's, it's a, it's a versatile instrument that, uh, has a lot of applications out there. So uh, in summary, uh, we talked about the importance of ethylene and gas analysis, how it plays a very vital role in the ripening process um, and being able to accurately and reliably monitor the ethylene level is, uh, is a really critical step to um, ensuring that you uh, have the highest quality and the most consistent produce possible. Um, I went over and kind of talked about all of our gas analyzers. So anything from 100 ppb to, to high levels of ethylene, um, we have an option for you. Uh, so for whatever your application is, um, I highly encourage you to reach out uh, to see, you know, if it's been done before or if we can uh, provide any insight uh, to how you might utilize our instruments for your application. Um, so the applications, we talked about those and, and then those use cases and the, uh, uh, in, the in the research field. Uh, so things like ripening and citrus degreening, storage monitoring, transport monitoring, 
quality management, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, forced uh, uh, stress uh, to cause accumulation of, of phenolics and, and things like that. So um, we really covered a really wide range of stuff today uh, uh, as far as um, getting to the basics of ethylene all the way to the specifics of what our instruments are being used for. Um, and honestly, we, we couldn't make our instruments as versatile as they are without the collab support and the collaboration of our users, um, people that uh, you know trial our beta units and, and stuff like that and give us feedback about um, you know their applications and learning more about other people's applications allows us to create these instruments to be as versatile as possible and as robust as possible so that they can suit um, any, any application and any customer's needs. Um, before we finish, I just really quick want to uh, talk about two uh, exciting upcoming releases we have. We have the F751 Kiwi Quality Meter coming out uh, soon, and that uh, will be uh, uh, similar to our F751 Avocado or Mango units. Um, you'll be able to measure dry bricks and, or sorry, dry matter and bricks uh, instantly, um, and, uh, and that'll be a really useful tool for the, the Kiwi industry. And then uh, on the CID bioscience side, we are uh, excited to be releasing early next year our new uh, CI710 leaf spectrometer. So it's a, a miniature leaf spectrometer that uh, uh, is able to measure reflectance, absorbance, and transmittance um, with uh, hundreds of built-in indices for analytes like chlorophyll, anthocyanins, carotenoids, and many more, and also the ability to create your own indices uh, and models. So. We're really excited about these upcoming releases. Uh, and and uh, if you want to uh, stay uh, connected with, with the updates on those and any other updates uh, about our instruments, um, we uh, please follow us on social media. Uh, the best way to get updates is through uh, our website as well. Um, uh, you can always feel free to send us emails if you need more information on something. Um, or uh, if you're ever in the uh, Portland, Oregon area or the Pacific Northwest, uh, we always welcome uh, our customers and, prospect and prospective customers to stop by our headquarters and see where it's all, all the magic happens. So um, we have our address here in, in Camas, Washington. And lastly, uh, we'll move on to the question and answer session. We do have a, uh, a, a quote link here. If you uh, are interested in requesting a quote for a gas analyzer, um, Susie will be posting that link in the chat box. So please uh, be sure to look at your chat box and, and make sure you uh, 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 click any links that uh, I discussed, any extra information that I discussed. Um, if you want to delve further into into what those studies were about, or or if you want to um, get more information on catalytic uh, generators, uh, they uh, have a link. Uh, we should have a link in our chat box for them as well. So um, now I think I will start with the question and answer. And um, looks like we have uh, sixteen questions uh, currently. So how this works is I'm going to uh, read aloud uh, the question back uh, so that everyone can hear what the question was and then um, I will answer it. If it is a question that is geared towards Greg, I will, um, I will make sure that uh, uh, I let Greg know and then he will, he will come back on and, and answer the question. So uh, the first question is uh, F900 only measures oxygen, carbon dioxide and ethylene only. Um, how about other gases like nitrogen? So yes, the F900 uh, uh, is only uh, uh, used for, we only have sensors in it for ethylene, uh, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Uh, why not other gases like nitrogen? Um, it's just not something that's been requested of us very often, and uh, uh, um, I'm not really 100% certain on the uh, uh, the chemistry behind getting an electrochemical sensor for nitrogen, um, how accurate that would be, um, and how we would be able to incorporate it into our uh, uh, existing instruments. So uh, for the time being, it's just uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and ethylene. Um, the F900 actually doesn't come with uh, the oxygen and carbon dioxide sensors built in, um, but we uh, uh, 
uh, if you request those sensors, uh, as well as the two ethylene sensors that are included with it, um, then we can install those in that system so that it can do all three um, measurements. The follow-up question to that is how often does the F900 require calibration? Um, it's similar uh, to the F950 in the sense that um, uh, the ethylene, uh, there's the actual span calibration does not need to be conducted um, very frequently. Twice a year is what we recommend, but the uh, you do need to make sure that you are uh, doing your zero uh, calibration for ethylene um, on a very regular basis, uh, just because uh, uh, you want to make sure that you aren't, uh, you don't have any sort of bias in your measurement to start off uh, with. So and that's a very easy process. It just involves connecting uh, uh, the uh, potassium permanganate chamber um, and, and, and filtering out any uh, uh, existing ethylene and then measuring, uh, doing a measurement uh, for a couple minutes uh, at 0% or 0 ppm, at ppm ethylene, um, and then that will give you your zero. Um, but a true full calibration uh, uh, should only be done um, uh, once a year uh, by, and usually typically we'll have uh, the user send it back to us for the, the full, full calibration. But a span calibration can be conducted by the user, um, and that usually happens about twice a year. All right, the next question is, three different gas analyzer calibration time, one week or one month or six months. So I'm gonna, and please ask another follow-up question if I'm interpreting this incorrectly, but I think you are either asking about the difference between the three gas analyzers or the difference between the three sensors within each of those gas analyzers. Um, either way, the three gas analyzers uh, uh, are very, the 940, 950, and 960 um, that, that all have all three sensors, um, they only require a, a, full, a full calibration once a year, uh, which means a full calibration includes us looking at multiple different uh, um, standard concentrations of gas and making sure that the sensor is reading exactly at those concentrations um, and, and performing maintenance and everything all back here at our facility. They only require a span calibration, which is just looking at the zero as well as one point on the, uh, in, the, in the measurement range uh, using a standard gas. Um, that only needs to happen uh, uh, twice a year. Um, and then the zeroing process, which I just described, only needs to happen uh, with ethylene. It needs to happen uh, fairly frequently. Uh, we recommend at least weekly, um, but with oxygen and carbon dioxide, that only needs to happen um, every six months uh, uh, or you know, as needed. If you can see that there's a bias present, then it's a pretty simple process to just do the zero calibration. The next question is, can the 940 be used to analyze respiration and how do you sample the fruit? So uh, the 940 uh, uh, and honestly the 950 or 960 all have a zero to 100% CO2 um, as well as oxygen sensors. So you could very well uh, use it in a continuous monitoring uh, uh, mode to look at the changes in, in carbon dioxide and oxygen to then uh, um, uh, correlate that to the respiration rate of the fruit. Um, and you could uh, do that uh, in a number of ways. You can create your own um, uh, chambers or, or kind of closed environments uh, where you uh, uh, can then set the, uh, the instrument in there. Um, you can also attach uh, uh, hoses uh, uh, to the instrument to, uh, if you are, if you, you need to be able to sample from a very small space, um, we have the attachment for the probe attachments. Um, uh, and so there's a really a, 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 an un, uh, unlimited number of ways in which you could sample your fruit. Um, you could also, if you already have a room, a whole cold storage room set up and you want to measure the total respiration in the room, 
you can just set the instrument somewhere in the room that has a, a good representation of the atmosphere within that room. Um, uh, but uh, what a lot of uh, uh, breeders and, and people that I've seen doing uh, experiments on, uh, on ripening and respiration of fruit um, typically create their own little closed environments with uh, uh, using some sort of uh, uh, sealed bucket or, or a, a jar or uh, something similar to our research kit. Um, and then they just sample, uh, have a sampling port that they use uh, to, to measure uh, the CO2 and the oxygen levels as well as the ethylene. The next question is, what is the lowest sample size of air? Um, and that is, that question, uh, uh, it's totally dependent on um, the level of analyte uh, within that air. So if you're asking what's the lowest sample size to determine um, really, really low levels of ethylene, um, then it could be, uh, uh, you know, the lowest possible sample size could be anywhere up to, you know, uh, 10 to, to 50 milliliters of air or, or more. Um, if you have something that's really saturated, uh, a really high concentration, really saturated, uh, a really homogeneous environment, it could take, uh, uh, you know, as little as five to 10 mils of air. So, it's really dependent uh, on what the air that you're sampling, the, the concentration of ethylene, um, uh, the concentration of analytes. Um, uh, so uh, the smallest you could possibly sample uh, is, uh, is about 10 mils of air. Uh, uh, and that is uh, to get an accurate view of something that uh, of an atmosphere that has uh, uh, a good concentration of your analyte, um, I guess is the simple answer there. The next question is, what instrument would be good for environmental gas analysis in a Kiwi cold storage uh, to check levels of ethylene, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, low levels of ethylene? Uh, with, uh, with the low levels of ethylene, uh, we recommend using uh, the F940. That one can get you down to PPB level uh, or range of, of, of ethylene, and it's still the handheld version of the instrument. Um, and uh, our instruments are capable of measuring uh, uh, between, uh, I believe, zero to 50 degrees. Uh, so uh, that is uh, a possibility. Um, uh, to use in the your Kiwi environment. The next question is, how about the 940 is not equipped with the filters that exist in the 900? So it it, it is uh, actually, uh, but you just, they aren't in the same uh, configuration as the as the 900 so the 900 you can see those two visible filters the the water polar sept as well as the the uh, potassium permanganate um, with the handheld instruments the smaller ones the 940 and 950 and 960 actually the potassium permanganate chamber is inside of the instrument itself so it is an internal filter so it's completely hidden and then the polar sept, uh, uh, there is a couple slides actually in the, the polar sept slide that I showed, uh, there is uh, there is like this attachment uh, on the back where the polar sept filter uh, uh, can be mounted. And then that is how, uh, that is where the polar sept uh, filter will exist uh, on the instrument. So it just, it just doesn't look the same as the 900, but they both filters are present. The next question is, what is the electrochemical method used for each of the gases? So for uh, the, uh, both ethylene and oxygen, I believe, uh, we use, uh, 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 we look, look at changes in current uh, of, the, of the ethylene, uh, or of the sensors, and then we actually use an, uh, a infrared pyroelectric sensor for CO2. Uh, so 
both oxygen and ethylene are using the, uh, the, the change in current uh, of, of those electrochemical sensors. And then CO2 is using a infrared uh, pyro, pyroelectric sensor. So the next question uh, is, in constant ethylene measurements, how often do these analyzers have to be calibrated or exchange the sensor? Um, that is wholly dependent on the uh, level of ethylene in the environment. So if you're doing a constant or continuous measurement, um, but the ethylene levels are extremely low, um, you know, at the very low end of your sensor's detection abilities, then it's not going to be, it's good, you'll be fine for, you know, to use that and, and only calibrate, you know, uh, do a span calibration once every six months. But if you're measuring on continuous mode at consistently at the high end of your uh, measurement range, then it's going to, it's going to wear out that sensor faster. The lifespan of the sensor is going to decrease. Um, uh, so it would cause you to have to uh, uh, probably uh, uh, speed up the time in which the time frame in which you end up having to do a span calibration or exchange that sensor. But the sensors, uh, uh, the sensor lifespans um, uh, are typically, I think it's uh, uh, two years for our ethylene sensors. It is, oh, it's one year for our ethylene sensors and then two years for our oxygen sensor and uh, uh, two years as well for our CO2. Oh, actually a CO2 sensor is five. Okay, five, five plus years uh, lifespan for our CO2. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, that, those, that lifespan may decrease depending on you know, how much ab uh, abuse uh, the sensor is going through, how high of levels, you know, if you're, if you're using it in continuous mode every day at the highest end of your measurement range, yeah, that lifespan is probably going to be cut in half. But if you're using it consistently in the middle, continuous mode in the middle of your range, then you'll probably have a normal, uh, you know, uh, one year life for your, for your ethylene or two years for your oxygen, five plus years for your carbon dioxide. So uh, the next question is, how do you know when the electrical, electrochemical sensor needs to be changed out? you'll know that when you are unable to successfully perform a calibration. So if uh, you go to attempt to do a zero or a span calibration and, and nothing you do is, 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 is uh, allowing you to get a, uh, uh, to actually get it into calibration, then there's likely an issue with your sensor being, uh, 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 you know, uh, or out, of, out of its lifespan, out of its lifetime. So um, that's, that's the best way to know. The next question is uh, for the trigger mode, how long does it take for one measurement? Uh, and uh, so typically it's, it's uh, uh, somewhere around uh, a little over a minute or so um, uh, for, for a trigger mode measurement. Um, but then you also have to make sure that it, you give it time in between measurements to uh, cycle out and, and, and scrub out uh, all the residual ethylene um, that might be present uh, within the, uh, the gas line. So, um, so uh, uh, the actual time of uh, the, the measurement itself of the gas, the sensor detecting the gas and that, and that being detected is, is just 12 seconds. Uh, but the pump, you have time that you need to allow the pump to actually pump in air um, or pump in, you know, whatever uh, uh, atmosphere you're sampling and then allow it time to scrub that out at the end as well. Um, the next question is uh, how, uh, how too useful in breeding? So uh, how useful is it in breeding? Um, I know of a couple of different uh, breeders that utilize this uh, just to look at uh, uh, ripening uh, 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 timelines of, of different varieties of their fruit. Um, I know people that use it uh, uh, to look at the effect of different uh, um, treatments uh, uh, on their uh, plants, uh, as well as uh, different treatments to the fruit directly. Um, uh, so I think overall, it'd be a great tool to assess, uh, to assess the, the characteristics, characteristics of respiration and, and ethylene production 
um, uh, uh, for different, uh, uh, you know, uh, different varieties of different cultivars of fruit. Uh, I think it is a great tool and has been used in, in breeding. Um, looks like I missed a, a, a question here. What is the, the, this question is, what is the temperature range for optimum measurements? Um, so the instrument itself works from uh, zero degrees Celsius to five or to 50 degrees Celsius. Um, so the optimum uh, measurement, uh, I guess, would probably just be at room temperature around 25 degrees Celsius. Um, but it works fine uh, uh, throughout that entire range. So I, it, I don't think you should limit yourself to only taking room temperature measurements. Um, it depends on as long as you are within that zero to 50 degrees centigrade um, range, then you're fine. Um, the next question is, how is the ethylene sensor maintained and set to zero? So uh, we do the set zero by uh, essentially creating a closed loop uh, with the uh, potassium permanganate chamber. So what you're doing is you're constantly pumping gas in a loop that is uh, uh, passing through a, a potassium permanganate chamber, which means that every time it passes through, it's scrubbing out more and more ethylene until eventually that air, that closed loop air is going to be completely devoid of any ethylene. And then you, the instrument will be able to s detect and you'll, and you'll tell it that this is zero PPM ethylene um, after it's, after it's uh, cycled through that uh, chamber a number of times. So the next question is, what is the accuracy of the oxygen, carbon dioxide, and ethylene sensors? So uh, in terms of, of relative accuracy, um, uh, it is 5% uh, accuracy for ethylene, 2% uh, accuracy for oxygen, and 3% accuracy for CO2. Uh, the next question is, is the polar sip used to protect the sensors of F940? We have to use it always or in what cases? Um, so the polar sept isn't uh, necessarily to protect the sensors as much as it is to uh, filter out uh, any potential volatile organic compounds or VOCs from uh, uh, falsely uh, uh, increasing your ethylene value or ethylene measurement. So uh, since the electrochemical sensor for ethylene isn't selective, it can't tell the difference between ethylene and say of uh, volatilized ethanol. And so the, and so if you had ethanol that was vaporized in your atmosphere, but as well as ethylene, uh, and say it was 20 ppm ethanol in the air and 20 ppm ethylene, and you were, you know, expecting only to get a 20 ppm result, if you didn't use the polar sept and you just did a sampling, your instrument would likely read 40 ppm and you would be wondering why is it so high and it's because all the volatile the volatilized ethanol that was in the in the area that you sampled uh, artificially inflated your results from your instrument so it's it it does uh, in some ways protect the sensor but it's mostly for ensuring that your eth eth or ethylene value that you are get getting from the instrument is as accurate as possible and does not include any influence from volatiles. So the next question is, how much does it cost to calibrate the sensor every six month or year period? So um, uh, that depends. Uh, uh, so we, for doing a span calibration, we encourage uh, that our customers, uh, uh, especially overseas customers, um, look into purchasing a standard ethylene gas of their, uh, that they can use um, uh, to, cal to do calibrations uh, on their own, which uh, uh, requires the use of, uh, of uh, just a standard gas and then a special type of regulator. Um, but to send it back to us, uh, uh, it, it depends on if it's a yearly calibration or if it's a special case. Um, so it, it's really uh, dependent. Um, if you need more information on that, uh, feel free to reach out to um, sale, our sales team uh, at the uh, email on the slide or the phone number on the slide. 
um, and we can um, uh, get you more information if uh, on that. Um, and then the last question here is, uh, can we increase the life of the ethylene sensor um, or the electrochemical sensor? So uh, the best way to uh, uh, make sure that uh, you have the maximum uh, use of your ethylene sensor throughout its entire lifetime um, is to uh, make sure that you're always uh, zeroing, that you're scrubbing out any ethylene um, uh, in between measurements. You're not uh, putting your uh, sensor through um, environments that are beyond its measurement range, so flooding it with uh, ethylene beyond what it was intended to measure. Um, these are all good ways to ensure that you will you can get the maximum lifetime out of your sensor. All right, that looks like it's all of the questions. Uh, if there's any other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to my email uh, uh, individually as well. Um, I'm always uh, happy to help our uh, customers or prospective customers answer questions about applications or or uses of the instrument or any other specifics. So um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Greg, uh, thank you so much uh, for your, your presentation. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties, but I still think uh, it was a wealth of, of, of great information. And uh, uh, we're really happy to have you on, on, on board with us to help us talk about uh, why ethylene is so important. So uh, thank you everyone for attending and thank you, Greg. And uh, we will see you. Uh, uh, soon we will have another webinar coming up on model building for the 750. Um, uh, and if uh, you know anyone that wants to uh, uh, watch this webinar, we do have another live uh, broadcasting of it tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Um, uh, everyone that was registered also will be receiving a, uh, a recording of this uh, webinar as well. So uh, everyone have a great rest of your day.